time to get your news on. We are VK1 WIA. And getting it on this week for week commencing July 2, 2023, WIA Director Stephen Green, VK2TSG, and Discussion Point with Jeff Emery, VK4ZPP. I'm Editor Graham, VK4BB, and, well, we won't do that again. Last week, I left all listeners hanging with a teaser for a special activity and promised not to steal the Secretary's thunder. Well, tucked away in Director Steve's board report this week is a brief mention of it. It was the 2024 WIA AGM to be held in May in Bundaberg. And hopefully by the time we get to Q News for VK4 listeners today, we'll have a report from the Bundy Ham Club, so stay tuned. Now, other news of note the past couple of weeks originates in the UK. A quite interesting edition of the ICQ podcast is available on YouTube when Martin Butler, N1MRB, W9ICQ, is joined by the RSGB president, John GI4BWM, Chairman Stewart, G3YSX, and General Manager of the RSGB, M1ACB. They'll all be along to discuss Ofcom's proposed changes to the UK amateur radio licence. And of course, in this edition of The News You Can Trust from Your WIA, our very own international man, Jason, VK2LAW, will also comment on the proposed changes. And the link to that YouTube is in the text edition. Best read at wia.org.au. Connecting Australian Radio Amateurs, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the weekly news service continues. We are VK1WIA. Hello, this is Stephen Green, VK2TSG, one of your WIA National Board members. Following on from last week's board comment from Giles, VK5GK, the WIA are looking for people to fill volunteer positions, most notably in technical areas, Youth on the Air, or IOTA, and the Ross Hull Memorial Contest. We've started to receive some expressions of interest, but if you feel that you would be suitably qualified, please pop your name in the proverbial hat for consideration. The process also lets us know of your interest in these areas for future opportunities, so please do not be discouraged if you're unsure if you quite meet what we're looking for at this time. The Board are also presently looking at opportunities to improve and upgrade resources for members, such as the website, MemNet, and the renewal and joining process. This also includes systems that are not yet automated and introduce breakdowns in communication when competing priorities interfere with the normal workflow. We've been listening to your feedback and being affected ourselves, we understand the frustration that these problems have created. If members have any suggestions for updates in these areas, please discuss with any of the board members or contact me via email to steve.green at board.wia.org.au. We wish to congratulate the Bundaberg Amateur Radio Club on their recent successful submission to the board requesting to host next year's WIA annual general meeting. This will be held in May 2024. Not only will they be hosting the AGM, but we'll be combining it with a showcase of amateur radio activities in a hamvention. The Bundaberg Mayor and Council CEO specifically endorsed the club's bid for the event and were keen to secure their town as the venue. There are still many details to be arranged, so please be on the lookout for future updates on the WIA website as details come to hand, as we'd like to see as many of you there as possible in May. 73 from Stephen, VK2 TSG. Across Australia from VK1 WIA, you're tuned to the WIA National News Service. In Borkham Hills, it can be heard on 147 megahertz on the Dural Repeater at 10 a.m. I'm Michelle, VK2 AYL. Hello, I'm Jeff Emery, VK4 ZPP, and I've been thinking. I wonder how many clubs are getting prepared for the next events on the calendar. For that matter, I wonder how many shacks and portable stations are ready too. With the strong possibility that we are heading into a La Nina event, the probable drier weather will be making it easier for outdoor activities, especially as we start to enter the warmer months. 
Joe Drew and Remembrance Day are two features of the event calendar each year, and some forward planning certainly sets the scene for successful participation. They're only weeks away, but we still have time for getting the stage set. It's always a scramble to get skeds lined up for the Jota stations to ensure the Scouts have the best experience of ham radio. Those people who will be running event stations can take this opportunity to send us a brief audio spot to help people plan ahead. So enjoy your radio until next week. I'm Jeff Emery and that's what I think. How about you? From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1 WIA. Now with international news, Jason, VK2 LAW. And the international news is with thanks to IARU, RSGB, RAC, ARRL, NZART, EHAM, Amateur Radio Newsline, RadioWorld.com and the worldwide sources of the WIA. Leading this week's international news from Region 1, Ofcom, the communications regulator for the United Kingdom, is requesting feedback to potential changes to the amateur radio licensing framework. Just a few of the changes outlined in the 101-page proposal include only permit licensees to hold a single individual licence, requiring surrender of lower licences as they progress. Increase the maximum permitted transmit power to allow 1,000 watts for full licensees in bands where amateur radio has a primary allocation. Allow foundation licensees to build their own equipment and access the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz bands. A full proposal is available via PDF on the Ofcom website. In news from Region 2, Women of Influence in Engineering 2023 Ham Honoree. Michelle Thompson, Whiskey 5 November Yankee Victor, co-founder and CEO of the Open Research Institute, ORI, has been selected as the 2023 honoree for the Women of Influence in Engineering section published by the San Diego Business Journal. The publication celebrates female trailblazers and highlights the honoree's careers and accomplishments. Michelle, Whiskey 5 November Yankee Victor, has been an amateur radio operator for more than 25 years and was drawn to the hobby by her father and grandfather who were amateur radio operators. In 2020, she founded ORI, a non-profit research and development organisation that provides all of its work to the general public under the principles of open source and open access to research. She's responsible for amateur satellite service regulatory reform and is a member of the FCC Technological Advisory Council. Michelle is also chair of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers San Diego section and founded the IEEE Information Theory Society, as well as the local open source digital radio group. W5NYV serves the ARRL Field Organization Southwestern Division as a technical specialist for the San Diego section and is an ARRL life member. With the broadcast industry and its allies in Washington, D.C. turning up the heat on automakers to keep AM in cars, any glimpse into what automotive companies are thinking about the dashboard is important. General Motors recently outlined its infotainment plans for new electric vehicles. Notably, the automaker says it will ditch phone projection systems for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in a number of 2024 models. In a media fact sheet, GM announced the move to an embedded Android automotive system from Google in its EVs. To help customers have seamless access to the full breadth of these experiences within our advanced in-vehicle displays, we will be integrating industry-leading applications such as Google Maps, Google Assistant, Amazon Music, Audible, Spotify, YouTube Music and more, GM stated in the release. GM's announcement contained no mention of AM-FM radio capability in their infotainment strategy. 
Hab's Eye selected for NASA grant proposal to support upcoming festivals of ionic science and solar eclipse QSO parties. Dr Nathaniel Frissel, Whiskey 2, November Alpha Foxtrot, lead organiser for HAMSI, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, has announced that the organisation has recently received a funding grant from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in support of its upcoming scientific research in ionospheric science regarding the upcoming 2023 and 2024 North American solar eclipses. The project will study the ionospheric response to the 2024 total solar eclipse through a series of large-scale citizen science experiments known as the HAMSI Festivals of Eclipse Ionospheric Science, which includes the solar eclipse QSO parties. The data for these experiments will be generated by amateur radio operators communicating with each other over and around the eclipse paths using medium and high-frequency signals that are refracted back to Earth by the ionosphere and therefore sensitive to eclipse-induced ionospheric changes. These festivals will be coordinated by HAMSI in collaboration with the amateur radio community. These experiments will build on the success of the exercise held during the 2017 Great American Eclipse, which generated over 2.5 million data points over the eight-hour period during the eclipse. In news from Region 3 to Ceylon, Work 10 for Sierra. Whiskey Tango for Sierra is an award by the Radio Society of Sri Lanka, RSSL. This esteemed award is open to amateur radio operators worldwide who can provide evidence of confirmed contacts with at least 10 amateurs from Sri Lanka. The award is applicable to contacts made on HF and 6 metre bands only, contacts made using any mode, including phone, CW, digital, RTTY, etc., are accepted and valid for the award. However, please be aware for non-Sri Lankan hams there is a fee, 25 US dollars wire transfer only. To apply for the award, please submit your logs to awards at rssl.lk with WT4S as the subject line. For VK1 WIA National News in Sydney, I'm Jason VK2LAW. Across Australia, from VK1 WIA You're tuned to the WIA National News Service. In Melbourne, it can be heard on VK3 REC 147.175 MHz at 9.30am. I'm Peter, VK3 YE. Now, operational news with Felix, VK4 FUQ. Hello there. And remember, ham radio operational news, it's contact sport. Now, contest-wise, while amateur radio teams from all over the world compete in the World Radio Sport Team Championship, July 8 and 9, hams from all over the world can compete right now along with the competitors. Organisers have announced that the WRTC 2022 Competition Award. Yes, it's still known as WRTC 2022 because of the one-year COVID delay. Hams who have had QSOs with competing stations in the championship can work towards this award by getting on the air during the contest and listening for the action. For more details about the competition award, visit wrtc2022.it and look under the News tab. The NZIT Memorial Contest is held every year on the Saturday and Sunday of the first weekend of July. So that's this weekend. IAHF World Championship Contest takes place the second full weekend of July, beginning 1200 hours UTC Saturday and ending 1200 hours UTC Sunday, July 8 and 9. July 15, trans Tasmania Beam Contest. Held on the third weekend in July, aims to encourage low band activity between VK and ZL. 160, 80 and 40 metres are allowed with SSB, CW and digital, RITI or PSK. Contest Manager, Alan Shannon, VK4SN. August 12, 13, Remembrance Day Contest. 
This contest commemorates the amateurs who died during World War II and is designed to encourage friendly participation and help improve the operating skills of participants. It is held on the weekend closest to the 15th of August, the date on which hostilities ceased with Japan in the southwest Pacific area. A perpetual trophy is awarded annually to the Australian state or territory with the best performance. The name of the winning state or territory is inscribed on the trophy, and that state or territory then holds the trophy for 12 months. The winning state or territory is also given a certificate, as they are leading entrants. August 26-27, a Lara contest. This contest is always held on the last full weekend of August. All licensed operators throughout the world are invited to participate. Scout and girl guide groups are encouraged to participate using their club's equipment and call sign. Wilds work everyone. OMs work wilds only. Combined phone and CW run over 24 hours. Saturday 0600 hours UTC till Sunday 0559 hours UTC. All HF bands except 160 meters and WARC bands. Echo link will also be accepted. October Oceania DX OCDX contest. Contest dates, times. Phone, the first four weekend in October each year, 0600 hours UTC, Saturday, 2600 hours UTC, Sunday. CW, second four weekend in October, from 0600 hours UTC, Saturday, to 0600 hours UTC, Sunday. Log deadline for all phone and CW logs, 31 October. DX window. VI-10 VKFF running all of 2023 celebrates the 10 year anniversary of the VKFF group. Special event station VI-100MB all year celebrates the centenary of the Mani Warringah Radio Society. China. QIV is BY2 stroke K6FA until the middle of August. HF bands using mainly CW. QSL via LATW. Listen for the special event call sign A60AP, which is on the air until the 31st of August. The subject stands for the Emirates Astronaut Program, which prepares crews of UAE astronauts for missions that include the International Space Station. QSL via EA7FTR. For VK1WIA National News, I'm Felix VK for a few Q Inningham. From here, there and everywhere, you've tuned to the Wireless Institute of Australia's National News Service. We are VK1WIA. Now, special interest group news with Bruce VK3 Triple F. And a very good day to you. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Final Frontier, China. Harbin Institute of Technology, developing new Lunar Amateur Radio Satellite. Lunar Oscar 2 is a Lunar Amateur Radio payload being developed by a team of students in Harbin Institute of Technology and International, all amateur radio enthusiasts. Its baseline functions include telemetry, digital image downlink from an infrared camera and digipeter with JT4G uplink and downlink. Amateur radio orbit determination experiments, for example, very long baseline interferometry, VLBI, are also possible with these links. Harbin Institute of Technology had previously successfully developed the first lunar amateur radio satellite, L094. As a subsequent mission, Lunar Oscar 2 will continue offering various resources for communications relay and amateur radio research and promoting the cooperation of amateur radio communities. Lunar Oscar 2 will utilise downlinks on UHF for telemetry and images using 250-500 board GMSK with turbo codes and digipeter using JT4G. The satellite is planned for a launch from Wenchang in 2024. 
A downlink on 437.750 MHz has been coordinated. Worldwide Special Interest Groups Maritime, ILLW. The ILLW weekend takes place over the weekend of August 19th to 20th. One to listen out for is Port Clinton Lighthouse in central USA. It's located at the mouth of the Portage River on Lake Erie. Activation on Saturday, August 19th from 1500 to 2100 UTC. Whiskey 8, Gulf November, Mexico 8 will be QRV from the Port Clinton Lighthouse during the ILLW, which is also Port Clinton Lighthouse Festival, Ohio. Check web clusters for specific frequencies, but typical 40 metre frequencies, 7.200 or 7.235, and typical 20 metre frequencies, 14.285 or 14.335 QSL via LOTW only to W8GNM forward slash 8 Worldwide Special Interest Groups Radio Amateur Old Timers July is upon us and Clive is here at the mic Hello everyone, this is Clive VK6CSW reminding you that the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club of Australia's July Bulletin goes to air tomorrow Frequency change Following the success of last month's trial the 00 hours UTC transmission will be on 28.450 MHz Full details of this change, plus all other broadcast times, can be found on the club website www.raotc.org.au or by googling RAOTC Broadcasts. This month, instead of the usual broadcast, we offer an interesting historical broadcast from 2001 by Alan Doble, VK3AMD. The usual news and information will be broadcast next month. Everyone, REOTC members and non-members alike, is most welcome to listen to the program and to join in the callbacks afterwards. If none of the transmission times suit you, you can download the audio file at any time from today from the club website. The next lunchtime meeting for members and friends of the REOTC in Perth is on Tuesday, July the 11th at the new venue, the Woodbridge Hotel East Guildford, starting at 11.30. All are welcome. See our website for full details. 7.3 from Clive, VK6, CSW. Once again, tune in tomorrow for the July RAOTC Bulletin. Enjoy the program and please join in the callbacks afterwards. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, Radio Amateur Young Timers, Yota, Youngsters on the Air. Young de-expeditioners set sights on Guana and with the story, Alec, VK2 APC. Thanks Bruce and welcome back. This story takes us to Guyana. That's the location a young quartet of de-expeditioners has its collective eye on. Their trip has been years in the making and now, with the travel precautions of the pandemic behind them, a team of de-expeditioners, all in their 20s, is finally free to travel to their destination, Guyana. Four friends, Jamie, MOSDV, Philip, DK6SP, Tommy, HA8RT, and Sven, DJ4MX, make up the team. Their youth hasn't stopped them from becoming veteran de-expeditioners. Jamie told Amateur Radio Newsline, We have been fortunate enough to visit some amazing locations worldwide. Now they are putting together their plan to operate in Guyana between the 14th and the 24th of next February, operating CW, SSB, FT8 and RTTY on the HF bands. They have not been yet assigned a call sign. The Northern California DX Foundation said that it has given the team a 5,000 US dollar grant as a way of encouraging the next generation of adventuring amateurs. Meanwhile in the UK, National Coding Week has been run for many years in the third week of September.
Coding is used increasingly in amateur radio, and the BBC Microbit and the Arduino have made it easier for radio amateurs of all ages to discover more about this. As part of its commitment to encourage youngsters into amateur radio and to support lifelong learning, the RSGB will be providing resources and creating coding activities for people to get involved in throughout the month of September. Now back to VK3 Triple F. Take it away, Bruce. Thanks, Alec. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Radio Scouting. Scouting in South Africa. Vortrek is to activate ZS9BKJ. The Vortrekkers will be activating special call sign Zulu Sierra 9 Bravo Kilo Juliet during their annual camp taking place from the 1st to the 8th of July at Port Edward on the Natal South Coast. The station will be active twice a day, in the morning and the afternoon. As the station is also an educational station, the young people will also be allowed to take part in the contacts made. The purpose of this is to expose the young people to the hobby. Transmissions will be on the 40 metre band. An electronic QSL card will be issued. All amateurs and scouts are invited to make contact with the ZS9 BKJ station. I'm Bruce, VK3 Triple F from Sunny Bendigo. Who listens to radio? Hi, this is Dan, VK6 NAD. Maria, VK5 MAZ. This is John, VK4 JJW. Lee Moyle, VK3 GK. This is Angelo, VK2NWT. To the 2023 social scene. And remember, clubs are welcome to submit text with audio for this section. And details of all WIA affiliated clubs and societies can be found on the WIA website, including email addresses and website links. In VK5, Adelaide Hills Amateur Radio Society's Buy and Sell at Marion RSL, July 15. In VK6, the Northern Corridor Radio Group Hamfest, August 20. VK4, it's Sunfest, September 9. Alara Meet 2023 happens November 4 and 5 in Hobart. Rosebud Radio Fest at the Eastbourne Primary School, Sunday, November 12 in VK3. And in VK5, Amateur Radio Experimenters Group Radio and Electronics Sale, November 28. Now, 2024, it's a date. As you heard at the top of the news, the WIA AGM will be held in May in Bundaberg, Queensland. And right across VK, National Volunteer Week. That happens Monday the 20th to Sunday the 26th of May. National Volunteer Week, NVW, is Australia's largest annual celebration of volunteers and their important contribution to our communities. And getting in early, we'd certainly like to thank all the volunteers that helped make this WIA National News the most listened to amateur radio news in the Southern Hemisphere. So now, till next we meet, I am Graham VK4BB. Walk softly. This is VK1 WIA. All points of contacts from today's news stories are to be found in print when you read the web editions, www.wia.org.au. This has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5, BD's ATV and YouTube channel, this has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like. Hello there, this is VK3 OTN the official station of the Radio Amateur Old Timers Club of Australia, with a monthly news broadcast for members and friends of the club for July 2023. This month, instead of the usual broadcast, we will offer an historical broadcast from years past. 
The usual news and information will be broadcast next month. I'm Andrew, the VK3 Charlie Alpha Hotel. I have broadcast files going back as far as 2001. Many of the older files aren't the greatest as far as technical quality goes, archived in either real audio or Windows Media audio format. These produced a smaller file size back in the days when the leading edge technology was dial-up internet. Remember that? This month we have an original broadcast from November 2001. Details on when to hear these news and information broadcasts are available at the club website www.raotc.org.au The VK3 OTN is available on a wide range of radio platforms HF, VHF and UHF two metre repeaters, amateur television, DMR that is digital mobile radio and D-Star These news broadcasts are available for download for up to six months just in case you miss the original news broadcast from the RAOTC website. If you'd like to contact the club, then why not send us an email? RAOTC at raotc.org.au I hope you enjoy this month's broadcast. Hi there, this is Alan Doble, VK3AMD with Associated Relay Stations as VK3OTN with our regular monthly bulletin of news and information for members and friends of the Radio Amateur Old Timers Club of Australia. In September all club members received information and a voting form to inform your committee of your wishes, read the proposal that the club should be incorporated. At the close of voting on October the 31st, there are only three negative votes and each of these members wrote a separate note to explain their thinking and that was good on them. The committee will now proceed with the task of bringing about the incorporation which members have now voted for but will take a few weeks to achieve. Uh, about this broadcast in changing conditions, we plan to continue transmissions to West Australia at the same, same time and same frequency as at present and look forward to callbacks on this as the only way we in the East can have a meeting with our friends in the West. Plans to beat worsening conditions are being uh, considered and we'll report on those as we progress. And in West Australia, the next luncheon meeting will be held at the Bayswater Tavern on Tuesday, November the 13th, at tomorrow week. And those present at the VK6 October luncheon included Poppy VK6YF and Bessie Patchett, uh, uh, Clem's wife, who was making a good recovery from medical problems, and that's good news. Another interesting item of club news from VK6 is that the annual fee for the club's VK6 OTN licence has been paid by the VK6 division of the WIA and this will continue in future years. Of further interest is the fact that this gesture was proposed to the VK6 division by, of the WIA by its president, Neil Penfold, VK6NE, in recognition of long-time service to the hobby of amateur radio by club members. A suitable letter of thanks has been sent by Clem, VK6CW of VK6OTN. This is VK3OTN. From South Australia, Ray Dean, VK5RK, reports that there was a call roll-up of about 33 at the October luncheon at the Marion Hotel. Ray also reports that Gordon Ragless, XVK5GR, who is now 90, is living in retirement at Marion Care in Marion. And Leith Cotton, VK5LG, is now in Milan, a nursing home in Morfordville. And Jack Townsend, VK5HT, the president of the South Australian group, is now permanently using a wheelchair but still able to keep radio contact. Ray himself is now recovering after a very uncomfortable eight-week bout of whooping cough. I hope all things are going well today, Ray. This is VK3OTN. Today we welcome the membership. Ray Rebellio, VK3EXL, a full member whose number is 1232. Don Bowman, VK6ZYZ, an associate member whose number is 1233. 
and John Lundy, BK3AZ, a full member whose number is 1234. And thankfully, I do not have to report to any silent keys this month. This is VK3OTN. Sid O'Neill, VK6MK, has provided the next item, and he says, It all started on the Buon Island, just off the coast of Borneo in 1951. I was a member of a small RAF, RAAF, detachment of 28 bots stationed there to provide signals facilities for transiting aircraft, both service and civilian. The tea in the mess used to be served up in big aluminium kettles with milk, which was wheat sheaves, seemed similar to carnation but much yellower in colour, already added. One particular evening there was considerable grumbling about the taste of the tea, even by the RAF personnel. We RAAF found it very off and declined to partake and dismissed it as one of those things. The next morning at breakfast, however, the tea was definitely undrinkable by all. So with a bit of urging, I trotted down to the RAF CO's bungalow, mug of tea in hand, and knocked on his door. When he bade me enter and state my business, I told him the tea was off and he would he care to sample it. He was sitting up in bed with his china teapot on the bedside table and declined my offer and said there was nothing wrong with his tea, to which I replied, no, there wouldn't be. He did, however, agree to investigate. The subsequent investigation revealed that our mess boys, who were responsible for lighting the fire under the big copper kettle, like those used for boiling the washing in days gone by, fitted with a tap, had decided in the interest of efficiency to eliminate the mixing of the tea and milk in the aluminium kettle. Instead, they chose to streamline the operation by adding the tea and the milk to the boiling copper, then just to count the tea as required into the kettles. Thus, the awful tea that night. However, not content with their efficiency thus far, they left the remainder of the tea in the copper overnight. Result, the fire under the next morning reborn the lot and then again decanted into the kettles for breakfast. Imagine for a moment the smell and taste of the mixture after standing overnight in the tropics. It gave a whole new meaning to the term stewed tea. And my reward for bringing to light these cost and labour saving practices, I was appointed to the messing committee for the remainder of my tour. But I have never taken milk in my tea since that time. Thank you, Sid. Very interesting. This is VK3 ACN. Jim Davis, VK7OW, has sent in some, in some very good pictures of Kingsley broadcast receivers as well as the famous AR7. He also enclosed a copy of a letter written to him in 1994 by Mrs. Kathleen Lechty, who was Kingsley Love's daughter. <coughs> Her letter reads as follows. <coughs> Dear Mr. Davis, I hope you may remember we corresponded in 1982 as you were interested in my late father Howard Kingsley Love and his radio business which operated from St Kilda Road, Melbourne during and for a short time after the Second War. It was so nice to hear from you and you wrote such interesting letters I have kept them all as you must have a wonderful radio museum. I wish you could have seen the radiogram you sent a copy photo of, but we don't do much travelling these days. My main purpose in writing is to ask if you know of any Kingsley radios which may be available to buy. It's disappointing that years ago we didn't keep any of my father's radios after they became out of date. The fact we deeply regret now as my sons are interested in obtaining a memento of their maternal grandfather's radio expertise. This may be an impossible request as his business was not very big and he worked on the AR7s during the war. But as you are in touch with so many amateurs, I thought I might just have some luck. Since my father died, we've lost touch with all his old friends and workmates and of course many would not still be around. I have written to Peter Wolven to ask if he could obtain a copy of the film about the Kingsley Radio Factory which I sent to the Wireless Institute but haven't had a reply as yet. The old films have now been put on a video and to complete the record I would like the factory film and one of his antenna or his friends which crashed. That's the friend's antenna. You probably know Bruce Henderson died two years ago and his wife Joe, 
my friend has had a stroke, which is very sad, and I'd be grateful if you could help me. With best wishes, Catherine Bickley. And um, the Jim Davis says that with George Nelson's help, they were able to locate a, an operation on AR-7 for Mrs. Blackley, who was duly grateful. This is VK-3 OTN. <coughs> the late Alan Hutchings VK-3 HL was very well known in pre-war years. I have before me a, a typewritten description of his operations written by the late Ivor Hodder, VK-3RH. It's undated and I think it would have been published in AR magazine, but I have no date for it. Anyway, it reads as follows. To all those shortwave enthusiasts who, during the past decade, have donned a pair of cans, VK3HL, otherwise Alan T. Hutchins of Bryn Avon at Kalawada, needs no introduction. Even less does he uh, require an introduction to those hands who have taken part in any DX contests uh, during a similar period. For although the Centauri Handicap is the first major trophy which Allen has landed, with the exception of a Yank contest in 1931, for which he only received some attractive wallpaper, he has given his fellow contestants a little anxiety and in many instances a hell of a fright. BK 3HL first punched a hole in the 300 metre band as plain ordinary 3HL, way back in the Dark Ages, before the era of prefixes, sales tax and scanties. On the wall of his shack, his station license over the faded signature combination of literary style and crook departmental ink of our past, present and future friend, one J. Malone, radio inspector, testifies that this was in January 1923. Alan began his activities in radio under the parental roof tree with the usual Hartley rig fitted into an imposing panel array. The receiver, a three-tube affair, was similar in size and possessed a changeover switch, which even today would do justice to the Elorn powerhouse. HT was then obtained from the 32-volt house lighting plant via a motor generator, but this has since been replaced by a more efficient 100-watt dynamotor. After some years of operation under these circumstances, VK3HL began to feel somewhat sympathetic toward his tubes for which he, with his mother, who was now BK3HM, and his sister Marjorie, who was now BK3HQ, showing more than passing interest in his hobby, he felt the transmitting glassware couldn't be expected to stand 24-hour operation in three ships. So he said goodbye to the old shack and its memories and pitched his tent, a very substantial and comfortable one, only a stone's throw away and at the same time espoused himself to the girl of his dreams. In no small way has his better half been responsible for Alan's success in his hobby due to the interest and sympathy she has shown with his work and particularly in keeping the eats up to him during his strenuous contest work. Other YLs and YFs, please note. The usual hand's cherished desire, WAC, was earned in 1928 and to date more than 50 countries have been contacted and perhaps more interesting still over 1,000 Yanks. Now, to get along to the technical side of things, we'll take the transmitter. The present thing is a rig is a thing of beauty and a joy, I almost said forever, but nothing stays put forever in a real ham shack. As will be seen from the photos, it takes the form of an aluminium panel <coughs> built up of a framework and oak, and the model finish gives it a really striking appearance. The design is such that all leads are reduced to a minimum and thus the almost impossible has been achieved, efficiency and appearance in combination. Although only three tubes are in use in the transmitter, it was designed to use four tubes ultimately and in the following order. TCO stroke 5 as oscillator, TCO 4 stroke 10 doubler, QCO 5 stroke 15 buffer or doubler, and either QCO5-15 or TCO5-25 is the final amplifier. There's some old tubes. During the recent contest, however, a PM24B was used as the crystal oscillator, and I, an E406 a doubler, an E406 in the PA, with an input of 23 watts. <coughs> Excuse me. 
The receiver is a recently built six tube super, super hit using two volt battery tubes and is built around a 1A6 mixer, mixer two 34s in IF, a PM1 HL detector, a 30 as a beat oscillator and a 33 output tube feeds the dynamic speaker. The job's an all wave affair using two separate two gang condensers, a .305 for the broadcast band and a .405 midget for the hand bands, which are, of course, band spread. The signal strength to noise level is particularly fine. <coughs> Excuse me. And lastly, but by no means least, we come to the aerial array, a factor which, in the opinion of the writer, contributed very little less than the man himself to the winning of the handicap. Most hands will probably be surprised to learn that it's a beam affair and that it is a beam which actually works and at the same time is relatively cheap. Two second harmonic radiators are arranged in the form of a V being fed at the apex by the usual zip feeders, three quarter wave in this case. The angle of the V is 80 degrees and this arrangement gives a decided directional effect and they are not reducing signal strength too much in the sideways direction. Compared with a half-wave horizontal aerial, DX reports indicated that the beam system increased signal strength in the USA by two points, while the Japanese reports revealed no drop in the strength as might have been expected. Two of these directional arrays were used in the contest, one focused on USA and the other on Europe. And in this manner, with a reduced input of nearly 50%, Reports on signal strength were similar to those usually obtained with the old aerial and normal power. This fact probably won the contest for VK3HL and is an excellent illustration of the platitude that brain counts more than brawn, just as much in amateur radio as it does in a brawl. All hands will undoubtedly join me in heartily congratulating VK3HL on his recent success and in wishing more power to his keying arm in the future. Well, that's an interesting story about uh, a long-time early amateur who's no longer with us. Uh, this is VK3AMB uh, for Radio Amateur Old Timers Club. And uh, I have here some information from George Howard, VK3 X-ray Jota, who was a Victorian police technician in the 1970s at the time when Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin. With a team of police operators, he was flown to Darwin to help restore communications. What follows is his story. He says, in the early 1970s, I was a young police officer employed at the Victoria Police Radio Electronics Division, Melbourne. I was one of several of the members who, who were or had been amateur radio enthusiasts employed by the department at that time. I use the words had been because there are quite a number of amateur operators who had passed through the division over the years and who are no longer active but still have license to operate or operated very infrequently. A perusal of past and present staff records could easily make one believe that amateurs could have been the founders of the division. There had been so many and it's sad to see that the Department of Innocence Wisdom has virtually abandoned the divisions of the public service and those dedicated personnel are no longer there. Without looking at a calendar, it must have been a Thursday or a Friday when the cyclone named Tracy hit Darwin and those in Melbourne became aware of the disaster and the fact that communications had been cut between Darwin and the rest of Australia. A local member, a local Melbourne amateur radio station at Templestone, owned and operated by Charlie White, BK3AUP, uh, trained his antennas in the direction of Darwin and began a listening watch and giving an occasional call. Chaz, as he was called, picked up a weak signal and with his powerful equipment made, uh, which I and many others believe was one of the first, if not the first, and only continuous radio communication for some days into, the Darwin, into Darwin following the cyclone disaster. It's my understanding that Charlie White, VK3AUP, contacted police headquarters and other authorities and became the official communication link, receiving messages, requests for assistance and all that sort of thing, and the official message handler for the government of messages to and from Darwin until government contact 
with the area was established. That's where I first got involved with Cyclone Tracy. Charlie had set up a 24-hour monitoring system staffed by several local amateur operators, of which I was one, and I was on leave at the time, having just returned from the Lakes entrance holiday with severe sunburn, and might add and can verify the statement above referring to the message handling. Thinking back, it must have been a Friday as I'd not been home very long from BK3AUP shack and I received a phone call from my office at the Radio Electronic Division asking if I'd be willing to go to Darwin as a technician with a contingent of D24 operators as part of the team to assist in re-establishing police communications. Of course I accepted. I was directed to report to D24 at Russell Street at 9am the following morning. The exact times and dates were a little hazy after all this time. However, I did report as directed and we were briefed on the situation and formed, informed we'd be leaving the following morning flying to Darwin under the control of Chief Inspector Eddie Young. We were then taken by bus to the RAAF depot at Leverton and fitted out in RAAF khaki clothing. I was directed to obtain all the necessary tools and equipment I would require for servicing communication equipment and also to take whatever spares I thought would be necessary. As it was a weekend, the radio store was closed and with permission I broke into the store, acquiring antennas, cable and a range of components and test equipment I thought me handy and just as well I did, as I'll explain later. The following day we were on board a domestic flight to Adelaide and there to transport on the largest plane I'd ever seen for our trip to Darwin. All the equipment was packed in the plane with the exception of a Cistern and Donna test set which I would not let out of my sight. And I basically carried on my knees to Darwin except on the northern journey to Adelaide where there were only nine of us in the plane and I strapped it into a passenger seat belt. It was approximately four hours flying time to Darwin and the sight from the air circling Darwin was unbelievable. To a Melbourneian, Darwin looked like a small town but the devastation was quite obvious and widespread. On alighting from the plane, the first thing that occurred, we were all given injections of some kind and warned not to drink the water as there was no power and all refrigeration, cooling and filtering equipment was unserviceable. <coughs> Meals on the first night were supplied at the local high school which had been turned into a disaster and temporary accommodation centre. There were no beds or sleeping facilities available and the only place to sleep was on the floor, carpeted if I remember correctly. The only problem was that the building had suffered during the storm and the carpet was wet and in one place by, it was wet by a couple of inches of water. I don't know where the others slept, but I remember dressing on the concrete steps at the front, being the only dry place I could find. Shortly afterwards, or the next day, we were billeted at the Territorial Hotel, a ten-storey building later bought, I believe, by the Hilton or another large company. The Territorial at least had electricity from its own generators on the ground and first floors, but no lifts or other luxuries. However, the kitchens were operational and we were looked after very well by chefs during our stay. Day two consisted of familiarisation of the area we had to control, arranging transport vehicles for our group, assessing the Darwin police communication system and all those sort of things that are necessary to gain knowledge of their communications and command structure. As for me, being the only technical member of the group, I was allocated communications maintenance area called DONT, which stood for Department of Northern Territory Workshops, which were located some five miles northeast of the city in Stewart Park Industrial Area. It appeared to me that being a territory, and nearly, nearly everything seemed to be controlled by the Commonwealth. This is VK3OTN. As it happened on my arrival, I met some old colleagues from Victoria who had migrated under law enforcement bodies interstate, and I was quickly supplied with the vehicle and introduced to those who mattered. Another surprise was the manager of the radio workshops at DONT who happened to be a radio amateur, name and course sign I don't remember now, and I received a good welcome by him. I was introduced to the other several technicians who in the main were ex-Navy personnel who got out of the service at Darwin but had not got much further. 
It was a real strange feeling and not such a great welcome from them as the word had gotten round that a copper was coming up from Melbourne. Although I was wearing RAAF tropical gear, Victoria Police badge was a must and had to be worn on the shirt pocket, which was a dead giveaway to all these bearded, tattooed ex-sailors who gave me the cold shoulder for the first two or three hours on the first day, but that didn't last long. In the radio workshop I was allocated in the area of bench space and I proceeded to bring in all the equipment I had brought from Melbourne and set up my work area, soldering iron, system and on a test set, multimeters, etc. And I looked around and found I was practically on my own with the nearest other tech about eight feet away. I had no idea what kind of equipment uh, they service, their frequencies or any details of their equipment at that point in time. I soon found out they serviced all the government communications, including ambulance, fire, police, UHF, VHF and HF communications. Having shut up, the manager came over and said, uh, put um, an STC-151 transceiver on the bench and asked me if I thought I could fix it. I thought my birthdays had come at once because I'd been servicing the same equipment in Melbourne. I opened it up and to my surprise thought something was setting me up and removed half the guts out of the radio and then I suddenly realised it was low band VHF and not high band as I'd been used to and to me this meant it would only take half the time to service. In next to no time I had the set tuned and running and I looked round to see the other text looking before long they were up to see how it was repaired so fast. A short demonstration on the tuning procedure and the ins and outs of the system and on a test set and a few explanations and the cold sh shoulder got warmer and by the end of the day everybody was on speaking terms. Looking around the workshop I discovered that their equipment was very basic compared to that being used in Victoria. They did not possess a modern test set such as the one I had brought and after a demonstration to the manager he placed an order for half a dozen of them with Canberra and two or three had been delivered before I returned to Melbourne. This is VK3 Hotel, the story of the uh, Cyclone Tracy in Darwin. The variation of equipment to be serviced was quite extensive and consisted of the most primitive Traeger Field HF equipment and covered many other brands and types of communication equipment. A considerable amount of the equipment and part I had brought with me turned out to be quite useful, and especially the antenna. Talking about antennas, I was asked if I could fit a radio into a new vehicle for one of the departments, which I promptly did. However, there was a problem which they were not too happy about. Every technician knows that an antenna is one of the most important parts for communication equipment. He also knows that it must be fitted correctly and earthed with a good ground plane if possible and in a position where it will not be affected by the surrounding part of the vehicle. In Melbourne we fitted them right in the centre of the roof because that's where they work best. And that's exactly what I did. When the boss saw it he nearly had a fit because up there they don't do that and they get fitted on sun visors and all those places and he was concerned at the cost of repairing the hole when they sold the vehicle somewhere down the track. It took some explaining that it did not really cut that much to fix the hole and eventually he faded to a light pink colour. If I remember correctly, before I came home, there were a few more vehicles floating around with antennas in the centre of the roof. This is VK3 OTN. The first consisted of a bit of fair bit of hard work setting up an emergency base station on the top of some multi-storey building. There were about ten. As there was no power and no lifts operating, everything, including batteries and generators, had to be carried upstairs, which were traversed a number of times during the setups. Communications had to be supplied and maintained at roadblocks and to all those service personnel in the rubble and cleaning up. And there was always something to be done. The radio operators from D24 had established themselves very quickly at police headquarters and within a few hours of their arrival you could notice the difference and things started to settle down under their professional operation. 
On the evening of my second day, I located the amateur radio station which had been transmitting to Melbourne at the AB Studios. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a Yazoo FT-101B transceiver and the antenna was tied to the flag pole outside the building. And over a period of five weeks I was there, I managed to send three or four messages back to Melbourne, but there was so much going on I couldn't spend much time. It was unfortunate I didn't have enough time to take a camera with me as I would have liked to have had a pictorial record of those times. Suffice to say that the Darwin amateurs did a very good job in establishing communications from the disaster area to the outside world when there were no other forms of communication available. I think uh, a thing I believed was not fully recognised by the government of the day. There were stories floating around other stations in Queensland and elsewhere involved and that other communications were working. But as far as I'm aware, the amateurs were the only line of communication for quite a long time. And then only very limited government communications were available for some weeks. It was not uncommon to see 40 or 50 people queuing up at the one and only public phone which only worked occasionally. I'm surprised at the lack of knowledge of communications displayed by some of the Navy technicians. The cyclone covered quite a large area and I was flown together with the local tech from the workshop the Wave Hill some 200 miles south of Darwin to get their radio back on the air after damage by the cyclone. On arrival I found the lattice tower had been bent in half and the antenna detached and on the ground. The technician that had come with me had no idea what to do, and so I just simply tied one end of the dipole to the remaining part of the tower and the other end to a boundary fence post. Called Darwin and got a loud and clear report back, and he was amazed and was up and working in under half an hour. The tower was replaced some time later. There were many stories that could be told about the effects of the cyclone on communication, the people and the damage that was caused, and the panic, and just as many that cannot be told. It should be said, however, that perhaps the Aborigines originally may have had some insight into what was about to happen, because in the five weeks that was there, I only saw one Aborigine. The cyclone apparently cleaned out all the hippies that were camped along the fort, who were much to the light of the most of the locals. As for me, it was a great experience, perhaps the experience of a lifetime, as one never knows what you can do until it has to be done, and I certainly gained a wealth of experience and confidence in such a short period of time. In closing, I guess the funny side was on one of the workshop technicians, a Scotsman, who was most upset and agitated because the cyclone had blown away his kilt and sporran. Nothing anybody could say or do could settle him down. Message was sent out all over the place and eventually someone found a kilt and setter in Perth and had to send up to him. And believe it or not, on his arrival, he was a totally different person altogether. Helen, all this was a long time ago, and the memory fades a little. There are many things I can't say, but in all, the Victorian contingent that was set to assist were called aside by the Commissioner in Darwin and received his personal thanks for the performance, except me, because I couldn't get there in time. The plaque present to Victoria used to hang on the wall at the old D24 Russell Street together with a photo of those that were there. I had these notes uh, help for your broadcast and letter. And that was from George Howard, BK3XD. Thank you, George. And scribbled at the bottom of this typewritten page, he says, I, if you're wondering how I got the locked radio store open at the RAAF base, I kicked it down. What a happy note. This is me, K3AMD and Associated Relay Stations uh, for the Radio Amateur Old Timers Club. And I think that just about does the trick for this morning. But um, let's have a look here. Oh, and this is perhaps an interesting little story to uh, finish on. It comes from the Royal Signals Journal in England, and the writer doesn't sign his name. Just after the war, a smart young Royal Signals National Service man was posted to Germany to an air formation unit. The unit was a small detachment on an RAF airfield, and being one of only six soldiers on the field among hundreds of light blue uniforms made one feel a bit out of it. Always having an interest in having a radio, the young service man decided to apply for a license, which was granted by G8KW, who was then D2KW, his name was Rowley Shears. 
A T-1154 and an AR-88 were borrowed and operations started from the wing of one of the large hammer, hangers. This was after inquiring some R-4 aerial wire from a nearby, nearby army unit. All went well until one Sunday evening. Whilst I was on the air, footsteps were heard coming up the stairs to the shack. The door opened and there stood the Padre. I wonder if you can help me, he said. I was listening to my radio when it suddenly went up in a puff of smoke. I understand that you signals chappies know all about radio. I didn't quite know what to say. I was a telegraph mechanic at the time. He went on, I feel it's divine intervention. You see, instead of listening to the BBC Sunday evening service, I was listening to Muffet Mozza, Moffat, who was a hot jazz and country DJ from the American Forces Network. Then it happened. To cut a long story short, the brand new R4 copper aerial wire had slowly stretched and had found the Padre's receiving aerial just as I'd been keen. All the T1154 output straight into the front end. I ummed and heard and said I'd see what I can do. I pulled the wire taut again and freed the Padre's aerial, looked at his charge set and said, I guess he was right. It must have been divine intervention. And on that happy note, I'll uh, leave you to our next merry meeting. This is Alan Doble, BK3AMD, and Associated Relay Stations is BK3OTN, the official call sign of the Radio Amateur Old Timers Club of Australia. We're now concluding our trash and transmission for this month, and I hope you found it interesting, and we'll be on the air again on Monday the 3rd of December and Monday the 4th of February. Repeat that, the 4th of February, because we do not have a transmission in January. Anyway, we'll be here in December. Times and frequencies can be checked in the current September issue of OTN and uh, will remain uh, as in the past. Please stand by and take part in the callback session on the frequency you've been listening to. Thank you for listening at 73. This is Alan Doble with VK3 OTN, and I'll take calls on two metres in a few moments' time. You have been listening to VK3 OTN. VK3 OTN is the official station of the Radio Amateurs Old Timers Club, Australia. This concludes this month's news and information bulletin. The next R-A-O-T-C news and information broadcast will take place on the first Monday of next month on the same frequencies, and at the same times as today, with the exception of January. Thanks for being with us and we hope you will join in the callbacks, where callbacks are taken. 73 everyone. We're in for a bumpy ride this week as Earth dodges multiple solar storm launches, but at least one of them's going to give us a glancing blow. That story and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan Michael Cook, and myself, as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is a bit of a mixed bag. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, look at all the little puffs all over the place. These are little mini solar storms, mainly filament launches, and this is what happens when we get close to solar maximum. They're just launching all the time. But the ones to watch is really from region 3354, right about late on the 27th, you can see whoosh! There goes a filament eruption. This structure looks like it's going to go pretty much east of Earth. You can see it in the coronagraphs, 
but there is an earth directed component so we could get an, an impact a glancing blow right around the first we'll talk more about that in a minute but believe it or not that's not the only thing as you continue watching this region even on late on the 28th into the 29th you see another slight kind of whoosh like eruption and then on the 29th near the end of that once again whoosh there is another eruption now both of these latter two eruptions look like you're going to go mainly northward of earth but there could be an earth directed component in one of them so we could be getting some glancing blows a little bit to the east of us and also to the north of us on top of that we're also getting a coronal hole that's rotating into the earth strike zone this could enhance the effects of this uh, the solar storms that are glancing blows so it's definitely going to be a bumpy ride for us as we move into the holiday weekend and then on the top of that, as we take a look at the east limb, you see a lot of regions that look like they're going to be rotating into Earth view but by the brightenings there. You also see that big eruption in the north. That's a far side eruption. So it tells you that we definitely have a lot of activity on Earth's far side. So definitely going to have to have that uh, solar flux remain high and those uh, risks for radio blackouts with big flares still on the menu. Switching to our M-Flare and Radio Blackout Threat Meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux over the course of this week, you can see we've been hovering above the seafloor and we've been popping quite a few solar flares. This does mean we have a lot of noise on the radio bands on Earth's day side this week and that trend is going to continue. We've been popping mainly uh, up to about R1 level radio blackouts and this is for mainly from region 3354, which is an X-Flare player, so we could conceivably see R2 to R3 level radio blackouts, although the risk is small. The largest flare we got was an uh, M3.85. Eh, it's almost an R2 level, not quite, but these are pretty short-lived flares, so they're not lasting all that long, which is good news. But meanwhile, this is going to continue easily over the next few days, and we could get even more activity as some of the regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view over the next few days look like they could be, be big flare players as well. Switching to our solar storm conditions, over the past week we've been hovering pretty much around unsettled conditions, although around the 24th and 25th we did bump up to storm levels due to a pocket of fast solar wind that was a bit more intense than we thought. It did bring us a little bit of a roar for a short bit, but all too quickly it was over. And then we continued around unsettled conditions, and now we're beginning to see these mini solar storms giving us these glancing blows. In fact, we bumped up to active conditions late on the 29th and into the 30th, and we should be seeing more of that as this new solar storm or set of solar storms give us this glancing blow over the first, possibly into the second, and into the third is when we'll start beginning to calm back down. Now returning to that solar storm that was launched back on the 27th, this is our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking at down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we take a look at that solar storm launch, you can see it's being launched mainly to the east of Earth, but there is a little bit of a finger that extends upward and is going to give us kind of a, that glancing blow right around uh, noon on the 1st is what NOAA's prediction model says. NASA's prediction model actually shows that we could have an impact that's a little bit more than a glancing blow, but in and around the same time period. So expect any time starting around midday on the 1st, expect to have some kind of impact. This means aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show. Aurora photographers, at mid-latitudes, well, it might be a bit more sporadic. However, we do have a fast solar wind stream that is uh, coming up right on the heels of that particular storm, and we have those other two glancing blows that are coming right behind that. So it's really going to be kind of a sporadic catch-as-catch-can when it comes to aurora. So only if you're dedicated should you go out and chase. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted viewer. You can see here's Earth Here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at the view in Stereo A, well, you can see region 3354. That's the most prominent region. It's also the most active. You can see it firing off some solar flares and even some solar storms lifting off from it as it makes its way to the west limb. But what I want you to focus on is the east limb in Stereo's view. Look at all that bright limb activity there. These are actually old regions that have survived their far side passage. In fact, when we take a look at the JSOC HMI Helioseismology far 
far side viewer, you can see those dark regions. These are regions from back on the 16th that were rotating to the sun's far side, regions 3329 and 3327. And these regions look like they've definitely grown and they are big flare players and solar storm producers. So this means we could have more chances for aurora and big solar storms being fired at Earth and also big flares. So amateur radio operators understand that flare risk is going to continue to stay pretty high. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the full moon phase with the full moon being on the third. And by the sixth, the moon will still be about 87% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, you're going to have this bright companion. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that glancing solar storm blow right around July 1st. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting uh, minor storm conditions with up to about a 30% chance for a major storm. And then after that, we are expecting that fast solar wind stream. It's not going to be all that fast, but it could give us a little bit of extended storming. So that will then cause things to calm down slowly over the second and then into the third before things really begin to get reasonably calm but we do have those other solar storms that look like they're going to go mainly north of earth but that could once again extend the storming a little bit so aurora photographers if you're at high latitudes you could get a decent show in around the first possibly in through the third before things calm down now at mid latitudes it's not quite as good of a show we are only expecting unsettled conditions pretty much all the way across the board even though we are having that solar storm hit NOAA is giving us about a 15 percent chance of a minor storm right around the first but again we could see a little bit of extended storming depending upon what kind of hits us after that so aurora uh, photographers at mid latitudes well it's going to be a bit more sporadic for you you might catch something here and there but only if you're dedicated should you chase Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a few active regions in Earth view, and the forecast is being driven by region 3354 because it's the most active by far. In fact, solar flux is staying in the 160s, and even as that region rotates to the sun's far side, it we still have the new regions that are going to rotate into view. So likely that solar flux is going to stay in where between the 150s and 160 range. This does mean that we do have moderate noise on the dayside radio bands. Again, region 3354 is very flare active. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 40% chance of M-class flares. This is at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout over the next few days. Now, our X-class flare risk has dropped a little bit. Uh, we're only at about an R, uh, a 5% chance of an R3 radio blackout, and that's going to continue. That might even drop off a little bit more, even as region uh, 3354 rotates to the sun's far side. We just have to see what those new regions are going to do as they rotate into Earth view. Now, switching to your radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green. We don't have any active uh, radiation storms right now, but as region 3354 rotates to the sun's far side, this could change. In fact, we're sitting at the D1 normal range right now for aviators. This is also the S0 quiet range, but we do have about a 10% chance of a radiation storm, and this is because that region is rotating to the sun's west limb that always makes that radiation storm risk increase. So you aviators and uh, air crew and frequent flyers, be aware that we do have an elevated risk right now for radiation storms. So make sure you take those ICAO advisories into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is a bit of a mixed bag. We do have that glancing solar storm blow that should hit us about midday on the 1st, and that could be followed by a small pocket of fast solar wind, which could be followed by some more glancing blows. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, you could get a show, you know, right around midday of the 1st, in through about the 3rd before things calm down. But aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, you know, these storms really aren't all that strong, and now you're fighting a full moon as well, so aurora shows could be a bit tough to catch. 
Now, amateur radio operators, well, you're dealing mainly with region 3354 right now, but we're only sitting at about R1 level radio blackouts. We could get an R2 level radio blackout, but luckily R3 level radio blackout risk has gone down quite a bit. So you're dealing mainly with noise on the bands, and luckily those radio blackouts from those big flares are not lasting all that long. So things may be a bit tough on the day side for a few days more, but things might quiet down a little bit for you. So just hang in there. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we've got that kind of those radio blackouts on Earth's day side, and now we've got some solar storming on the night side. So things could be a little bit dicey all the way around. So be sure to stay away from dawn and dusk and stay away from Aurora on Earth's night side for your GPS reception to stay top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.